What is up, everybody? My name is James D. Fiore, and this is Blackballed. As you know, if you are a regular listener or viewer of the show, for the last couple months, we have been interviewing an assortment of excommunicated members of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, or as I like to call it, the Plymouth Brethren Christian Cult. And today is no different. But this one is a little bit different in the sense that the person that I'm interviewing today was actually a leader, the leader, I believe, in the Australian Plymouth Brethren, and he was excommunicated 38 years ago, and I'm just going to read something really quick. This is uh, uh, an article from 2006, but I think it kind of typifies what this person has been dealing with and and where the cult stands as far as, um, as being that nightmarish organization that we all are coming to learn it is. Ron Fox, once the Brethren's Australian leader, was excommunicated, it says 22 years ago, it's 38 now, because someone saw him as a political threat to Symington, the then world leader. He lost his wife and six children, who he hasn't seen from that day to this. I was physically and emotionally, mentally totally devastated because it was so unexpected. I lived like a hermit virtually for seven years. I begged to be reconciled because at that stage, I knew nothing different. It was my life. I loved my wife and children. I ached for them and I begged for them. Gradually, though, he realized the unchristian nature of the whole Brethren movement and reached a point where he could not go back. He continued writing to them until each of his children wrote back, saying they never wanted to see him again unless he was with the Brethren. I would like to welcome that man to the show right now. His name is Ron Fox. Ron, welcome to Black Belt, sir. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you. I'm a father of two kids, and I can't even imagine um, what it would be like to be in that position. I saw it in the Breaking Brethren documentary with Dennis Rag, who uh, who had saved a phone call between himself and his eight year old son, and his son was very adamant, "I do not want to see you, Dad," and it broke my heart. And I read stories like yours, and I just get plunged right back into into that sort of spot where I where it's a it's an emotional experience for me, I, and I never fancied myself as a person who allows himself to get emotional about things that have nothing to do with me. And now I feel like I'm growing because of this, but let's, if we can start at the beginning, obviously the, the Plymouth brethren Christian church is something that you're born into. Um, it's very rare. I I've heard it's happened one or two times or whatever, where you can get tapped and join in, but mostly it's, it's, you're born into it. Can you give me a sense of what it was like growing up and starting a family in the Plymouth before you had the, um, the, the good sense, I guess I would say, to leave? Well, of course, uh, the, the, it's a rebadged name. It was always known as the exclusive brethren, as distinct from the open brethren. So, yes, I was born into that. I had a loving father and mother. Uh, we grew up on a orchard just in the hills out of Perth. And my childhood... I have no bad memories about it. Um, church was completely different in those days. It was generally uh, Sunday only, maybe once through the week, uh, where us kids never went. But um, it was a happy uh, existence. From 1960 on, uh, with the introduction of Jim Taylor from New York as the worldwide leader, uh, things changed dramatically. The doctrine of separation was enforced so that if one member was not uh, a member, if one party, uh, party to the marriage was not a member of the, uh, the brethren, then the party who was a member uh, was forced to separate from their spouse. And that's where that whole doctrine of marital separation uh, began. 
So, yes, I married a, uh, a Sydney girl um, at 23 years of age. We had a loving marriage. Um, it was a marriage where I have no uh, sense of there was no conflict, there was no disagreements. And we had six beautiful children, the eldest indeed, uh, was, is autistic, and he is now 55 uh, years of age. And uh, I love my beloved children deeply to this day. I don't blame them for the, uh, for the separation. Um, I blame the Brethren Doctrine. And go on. No, uh, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. Um, I have not seen my children in 38 years, apart from one time when I knocked on the door in 1991. And um, then I, a few days later, I received letters from each one of them uh, saying that uh, I was a wicked person um, I was withdrawn from or excommunicated and they no longer wanted to see me. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So you, you go on now. Yeah, no, it's, it's like I said, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. I don't know how to even like, um, expand on, on it. it it's, it's just heartbreaking. You were also though, um, when, can you describe the, the, situation or the political strife that pushed you out um because you were once the leader in australia and was there a sort of um a power struggle between yourself and james symington uh, i wasn't aware of any power struggle um i had been in the march of uh, 1984 i'd uh, been in america and uh, in Winnipeg and then in Netchi, where Jim Symington was local. <clears throat> I was asked my advice in relation to a administrative matter in Winnipeg. And I gave my advice and Jim Symington took exception to that. And uh, I'd only got home a week when I was summarily excommunicated. Never told the reason. Indeed, the night I was excommunicated, uh, two um, priests, two men came to my door and said, you've been withdrawn from. I said, what for? They said, you better find that out yourself, that you're not to sleep with your wife. And of course, uh, a few days after that, my wife came to me and um, said, Mr. Symington wants me to separate from you. And I'm minded to do that. Well, I mean, that was absolutely devastating, but I knew what the score was. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, There's um, th a, a few ex-members have described how they they were really tentative to try to write letters or contact loved ones that remained inside the Brethren um, because of the blowback that the family would receive um, if you had tried doing that. Is that accurate? And in your experience, was that one of the things that you had to always sort of weigh your emotions against that sort of strategic idea of not making life worse for them? Yeah, there was that. And I wouldn't have wanted to make life worse for my children um, who I dearly loved. That's why I never went to court for... Uh, for access, even though access in the separation agreement was guaranteed. And when I spoke to uh, one of the so-called priests in relation to that, he said, you know what the score is? And of course, I did know what the score was because uh, to my shame, I'd also been involved in um, custody cases, uh, of which I have deep, deep regret and uh, and shame about it there's a documentary called going clear um that i've seen on netflix and it's it's about scientology and it is eerily similar um there there's a person i forget his name right now but he he was um he was like you he was a leader 
Um, he was a, a high ranking member at least. And he was responsible for um, putting private investigators on people who were excommunicated and to help basically destroying their lives or the relationships with their family. And it sounds so familiar when, when the brethren, when ex members of the brethren like yourself talk about that regret, because once you go through it yourself, I mean, was there a moment, like, was there a moment when you were, when you were doing sort of some of the th shady things that the brethren are known to do where it, where you, you, you had to stop and you said, you know, this isn't right. Like what was the breaking point? I guess my question is. Well, of course you've brainwashed. I mean, you've known nothing else from infancy and you become so indoctrinated that you do things that, as I may express it now, are unchristian mm -hmm. uh, for the furtherance of the group. And that's the, that's the tragic thing. We spoke a little bit before we went on air about um, what it did to your faith. And th there seems to be a couple types of brethren. Um, some go full on atheist and, and some realize that when their faith had been weaponized against them and they were brainwashed inside this cult, that it made their real faith or their pure faith that much stronger once they left. And that seems to be in the case with you. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a very strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is my savior. Um, sadly, many have been so badly hurt that um, they turn, they throw everything out. And um, in that sense, I can totally understand it. For me, thankfully, it worked the other way. Uh, living alone for eight years and uh, virtually like a hermit, I've said to many people that they were both the best years and the worst years of my life. They were the, the worst years because of total loneliness. Hmm. But they were the best years because it drew my heart closer to the Lord Jesus. And for me, that was so important. What What is it? I want to pivot a bit just because I want to be able to cover the business side of, of the brethren, because I'm of the mind and I could be totally wrong that m many of the leaders, uh, especially the people like Jim Taylor and James Symington, I have a hard time believing that they're true believers because of how greedy they seemed. And I don't know how they reconciled their faith with that greed. Is that something that I should think twice about or do you think that there is a way that true believers can balance being that greedy because it's because there's a lot of money tied in with the brethren you have envelopes of cash being sent from all around the world you have all these different denominations and i compared it to that that's the mafia that's how the mafia operates envelopes of cash to the to the leader to the dawn basically um it, it was there do you think that leaders like Jim Taylor and James Symington, were they true believers and they just somehow were hip hypocrites or, or do you think that they were taking advantage of a flock who believed and they were just in it for the money? Um, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I probably am not qualified to, to comment on that. Um, the obsession, Can you see how that... someone from outside of the brethren might feel that way though. Uh, of course, of course, mm -hmm. of course. Um, the obsession with money is a relatively new thing. Growing up, I mean, I had, I went into my own business at the age of 21 into small manufacturing businesses in the sheet metal industry. <clears throat> and while they prospered moderately, uh, there was no obsession with, with money as there is today. Uh, I can't answer for Jim Symington. I mean, uh, uh, in my mind, he became a very ruthless uh, person. Um, I honestly never saw an obsession with money with him as I probably would uh, in the last 20 odd years. Would you be surprised or do you already know that when he died, they found something like $20 million in his house? <laughs> No, I wouldn't be surprised because of the amount of gifts he received. Um, okay. 
what are some of these stories that maybe listen i'm having a law all these people on including yourself because in canada right now we seem to have a media that doesn't have an appetite to talk about the cult that seems to be very successful in garnering millions and millions of dollars in government contracts um, I know the money stuff kind of came before your time, but I know in Australia, there's a similar problem. I know in the UK, there's a similar problem. New Zealand has a similar problem. This is a pattern in this organization. Um, what is the, I mean, is there, is, is the brethren in Australia a household name? And if so, are they a household name for the reasons that I'm listing right now with these, with these big fat contracts and, and sort of a, um, a suspicion that maybe the, they, they are just way too close to government? Um, I think they, uh, from the time when uh, Bruce Hales took over, their relationship with government has definitely uh, increased. I'm not personally aware of um, what their relationship is. I know they had a strong relationship with John Howard. Um, but it wasn't this, it was that wasn't the case going back 40 50 years ago yeah that's what i've i've, I've heard that i heard um the hales uh Sim simington to a certain point but then the hales really kind of injected steroids into the whole corporate enterprise of the of the brethren and um that's what we're trying to wrestle with here in canada um what kind of blowback have you received since you've left? Did you go through the same gauntlet as Richard Marsh, who was basically stalked um, by private investigators for, sounds like, years on end? It's, say that again, please. I was just wondering uh, if, you, if there was any blowback that you had to endure when you were excommunicated with private investigators and with people snooping around or trying to make your life a living hell. Oh, absolutely. Um, Can you give me examples? I, uh, yes. Uh, I started to go in 1991 uh, to a Baptist church in Perth, <clears throat> and that's where I met my, uh, my wife, my present wife. And um, after a uh, coming out of the church, after a gospel preaching, uh, I would see uh, a car, maybe two cars of brethren who I recognised and they followed me, um, trying to get something on me, obviously, in relation to my new relationship with uh, my present wife. That's, you know, that's 30 odd years ago. And what kind of things did they do? Oh, they, uh, they came around at night to see if there was any other car there. They... Uh, they put a mask on and went to a restaurant when I took my present wife out for a meal with her daughter. Um, yeah, they just tried to uh, intrude into areas that they had no business intruding into. And, okay, uh, I, I want to pivot to something a little bit darker right now. Uh, you may or may not have seen the podcast that I did with Cheryl Hope from yes, Maple sir. Creek, Saskatchewan. Yeah, I did, and I was absolutely gutted by it. So was most people that I know that watched it. Um, listen, I, I, I don't want to get anyone in legal trouble, so you can speak in generalities. That's totally fine. How bad of a problem do you, can you surmise, uh, not just from that interview, but just in your experience in the Brethren and maybe the things that you've read, how bad of a problem is the abuse of children inside this organization? Well, that appeared to me to be a very, very extreme case. I mean, I've never heard of anything as dark and as horrible and as defiling uh, as that. I mean, to to go through what that dear lady has gone through is absolutely horrific. And uh, if uh, if brethren in Maple Creek, anybody knew anything about that and hit it, then they they need to uh, to face the law in relation to that. Uh, I was privy to uh, certain things. I mean, I, I do believe there'd been cover-ups uh, in the brethren uh, in relation to um, uh, pedophilia. Um, 
similar to what you found in the Catholic Church. The idea was that you would meet it in a house and generally the person was excommunicated. Uh, but giving it to the authorities was totally a rarity. Yeah, that, I mean, it's 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 not funny at all, obviously. It's, uh, I'm going to have to choose my words here carefully because uh, the, the Catholic Church went as far as actually Pope Benedict was, when he was a cardinal, was the author of the internal policy that forced the diocese to transfer priests and handle pedophilia cases internally rather than give it to the authorities. Um, what it feels like with the brethren is from the examples, because I've been inundated with uh, emails since Cheryl Hope's appearance on the podcast of just awful, just equally as awful horror stories about sexual abuse. And the thing that seemed to stay consistent was not a cover up mentality, but a turn a blind eye and attack the victim. Uh, that certainly happened. Uh, I'm aware of um, uh, cases where that has actually happened. Um, that's a horrible thing to, to do that. But what, one thing you've got to understand is that the exclusive brethren regard themselves, and it's been stated in their ministry, that they are the highest court in the land. <clears throat> that is that um, what they adjudicate, what they... Um, what they conclude in relation to any matter is higher in their judgment than the actual courts of, of any one of any country. What's what's interesting about that, and and I I've been comparing okay I've been comparing the exclusive brethren to Scientology and how they make money and excommunicate with private investigators. I've compared them to the Catholic Church because of the pedophilia stuff. The internal almost adjudication system that they have that's islam <laughs> that's what islam does right like they you know, they they are such a unique cult in that and, and that they seem to borrow all the worst elements from all these different religions all without a sense of irony you know like i i am uh, and and if i look over the cases over the years Brethren bid to cover up sex assault on girls. I believe that's from the UK. This one says potential witness in exclusive brethren sex abuse case paid to remain silent. Also, I, I believe most of these are actually the UK and Australia. I was raped by leader of ex exclusive brethren. Shock testimony from a man who alleges he was abused as a child by Big Jim Taylor. Rocks the church's claim to charitable status. That's the UK. This one is awful he's like a father to me herring note written by girl 12 who was molested by an exclusive brethren leader after members including her own mother convinced her to say she had made up the rape hmm. when you say brainwash that's what you mean right totally that uh that the uh, the the, bre the brethren position takes precedence over everything else and you brought up uh with that mindset and uh, it governs and controls your thinking. What is What was Ray Fox like 40 years ago? How would you describe yourself? Um, Does he seem like a stranger to you now? Like, are you totally different or are you the same person and you've just been cleansed of that awful organization? Well, I trust, uh, I trust with every, <laughs> with all my being that I'm a different person. Uh, I, I'm ashamed, totally ashamed of some of the things that I enacted when I was in the Brethren. Um, I mean, for instance, you, you may have heard, you may not have heard of what's referred to as the seven day matters in 1981, 82. Uh, one of the things that rests on my uh, mind is a case in London, England, where this woman, for some misdemeanor many, many years before, was withdrawn from, excommunicated. And the thing was, she was such, so affected by the shame of it that uh, the poor dear woman, the young woman, hung herself. Oh. 
uh, while her husband and children were out going for a walk in the park. And Mr. Symington's comment in relation to that matter, he said, that was the devil's, that's her taking her life, that was the devil's attack against priestly function. And I'm so ashamed of that unchrist like attitude that would utter such words. And yet at the time, I accepted it. That is a horrible story and it is a clear example of how faith has been weaponized in this organization, hasn't it? Like without the weaponization, without weaponizing the faith of the flock, let's just say, this cult wouldn't be able to survive, would it? Uh, no, no, absolutely. Your, your loyalty is to a higher thing. Instead of, I mean, from a Christian perspective, my loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not so with the brethren. Your first loyalty is to the position hmm. and everything to protect the position. And the universal leader, is it? it's my understanding that the universal leader is a person that the that members of the of the cult believe can literally speak with Jesus. Isn't that right? Not, not in the more, not, not in the um, ambiguous way of praying and all that, but literally speak to him. Yeah. He's been elevated above the place of, uh, of Christ. Uh, and that's the horrible thing that uh, um, they view him as the mouthpiece of God on earth. But that's not unique to the brethren. You see, that's uh, that would be true with uh, Mormonism, uh, true C with Catholicism, um, Jehovah's Witness, uh, with Catholicism, and a whole range of isms. Yeah, I think what, once you get to a place where someone's claiming they can, uh, they have Jesus on their speed dial. I think it's probably time to take a step back and reevaluate <laughs> things. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Do you have? Um, first of all. I, I should have said this at the beginning. Thank you so much um, for, for coming on. It, it can't be easy to admit, I guess it might be the right word, or or describe yourself when you're with the brethren. You said you had shame attached to it. And I think it's really not only impressive, but important that a person that was in at, at such a high level of leadership in your country, inside the, the brethren, is able to to speak like this. Are you worried that this interview even might cause you some sort of blowback? Um. Well, I mean, I'm. They can't do much more to me. <laughs> I mean, I've I've lost everything that was precious to me at that point. Um, my wife, my uh, my children. Uh, my grandchildren, I have, I think, something like 22 grandchildren now. I have uh, some great grandchildren. None of these I've seen. So there's not much more they can do. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I, I have another guest here and I'm going to bring him now. I often bring him in sometimes because. I find that without my firsthand experience and knowledge of the brethren, that it's really helpful to have somebody on the show um, who can sort of help me navigate some of these questions. And uh, so I have Richard Marsh standing by. Richard, how are you, buddy? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Good. You've been listening in. Um, okay. <clears throat> do you have any questions for, for Ron? Because I, I find myself like completely floored at uh, every time I talk to an ex-brethren member, I'm floored. Uh, but maybe there's something that you can uh, shed light on or or that I'm not thinking about that would be a fruitful discussion here. Yeah, hello, Mr. Ron. Nice hello, Richard. How are you? Yeah, I'm yeah. good, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to understand more, and I, I think the, the audience uh, who have never been in the Brethren or would know much about the Brethren, it would be helpful for them to understand how the hierarchy or the administration works in the in the brethren because it's very different from conventional mainstream churches could you just explain um as having been in a you know a high up position in that hierarchy how it actually functions 
Well, I suppose uh, if you demonstrate a total loyalty to Brethren Doctrine, uh, which I did, and was very familiar with the the teachings of uh, of Darby Raven Taylor Senior and so on. And you show a commitment to that. I suppose that, in a certain sense, qualifies you for uh, how should I put it? Uh, I mean promotion. I mean, I first was invited to go to the Bristol uh, Levitical meetings in 1969. I was only 26 years of age uh, and then continued to go um, until I was excommunicated in 1984. So I suppose that's a stepping stone. Um, I began to take meetings, uh, fellowship meetings, and then three-day meetings. And they were at the suggestion of Jim Symington, by the way, um from 1975 uh through to when i was um excommunicated uh he directed the brethren to in different places to ask me to take three day meetings or fellowship meetings uh i never initiated those that was his suggestion so i guess that's how the thing works and i mean the same would have been true for in your knowledge of what happened in England. I mean, I knew most of the um, uh, prominent uh, people. I mean, going back to Henry McGackie and yes. Laurie Marsh, of course. Are you related to Laurie? Uh, no, I'm not. No. no. That, that, that's usually, that was the first question I always got asked when I was in the Brethren. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> as who who is that person? Oh, he was a prominent, a prominent, brother in the UK who ran the Bible and Gospel Trust, which is their printing uh, depot in the UK. Wait a second. Um, How are you not related to him if the brethren is so tight knit and, you know, you can only be born into it? Is there just... Uh, well, Marsh is quite a common name in the UK. I oh. think there are at least three unrelated families of Marshes. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Just checking. Yeah. I have a question for Ron. Ron, what do you, how do you think life would have been different for you? And do you think that you would have been able to find it, find the inner strength to leave if you became universal leader instead of James Symington? Um, probably not. No. Probably not. Uh, it's a hypothetical. Uh, yeah, sorry raising. about that. So, so it's it's difficult to answer that question, but I would say no. I, I mean, in my experience, I had to be excommunicated to really come to myself. So I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, even though it's been painful awfully painful to the you know the loss of everything you love and everything you knew but i truly thank god for that i th i thank him that he delivered me from a system where man has taken precedence yeah and a lot of it, it well all of it really today has to do with this man um i i <laughs> I have he's, put on a lot, had... he's put on a lot of weight since I saw him. Yeah, apparently he. Apparently that's the. Uh, I, I, I don't know, um, Richard. There, there aren't there like a, like an entire series of memes dedicated to Bruce Hales's uh, transformation with his body weight over the years, which not really is yeah, you know, uh, the yeah, nicest way are. to express probably dismay. Are. But you know, yes. Um, yeah. I want to make him famous for some reason um, outside of Australia because it seems to me that government shouldn't be paying companies owned by cults millions and millions of dollars for anything. And this man, I don't know how he's done it, but the organization itself, there was a figure tossed around. I don't know. Maybe Richard, you might know better than I do where the, the, the coffers of all of these businesses combined is something like $22 billion. Could that be right? Yeah. Yeah. That's reasonable. I, I mean, it's so self-evidently corrupt. I, I'm, I find myself really like you guys are two ex-members of this group, and and you have a totally different perspective. Clearly, 
I am sometimes um, without the ability to come up with the words uh, to express what I think is so painfully obvious, which is that this organization is a criminal organization. Uh, in the way that they brainwash the the people that are born into it, in the way that they treat women, in the way that they don't take accountability for certain members or elders abusing children. I, I am completely flabbergasted that if any government official, whether it's uh, former prime minister, was it Henry in the in Australia? Um, John Henry, was that who it was? John Howard. Howard, sorry, John yeah. Howard. Um to to our prime minister Stephen Harper, like, like I, I'm I'm speechless. I, I don't know why it's not such uh, uh, an obvious thing to politicians and to the media. Why is there so much trouble trying to call this group out for what they are and have people listen? Either one of you can feel that. How about Richard? Well, uh, the, or, there was sorry. a um, there was a prime minister. Uh, Kevin Rudd, who actually referred to the exclusive brethren as a cult, um, he, um, I think that's around about 15 years ago, something like that. Did anything happen to him? Was there ramif- Was there consequences to that statement? <laughs> well, he was voted out of office. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can you explain, can either one of you explain why it is so difficult for media and government to to recognize this group for what it is? Well, they have a very, they have a very powerful PR uh, thrust with their own website and they're no doubt contacting their MPs and influential people with literature and videos. Um, they claim repeatedly that they're a mainstream Christian church. And so basically the uh, a, a government member or prime minister has two competing narratives going on. One is that this is a very conventional Christian group that does a lot of good work. Uh, and then there's this narrative of people making claims that sound extreme and improbable. So, uh, Probably the, the Brethren's very polished propaganda has more credibility in their mind than these claims that are so dark that they sound as if they've been made up. Yeah. yeah and also in the last 12 years, I've set up uh, a charitable uh, organisation called RRT, Rapid Relief Team, where they come to uh, the aid of in disasters or if there's uh, floods or fires and that sort of thing. And that certainly has been appreciated by the government. Now, I'm not prepared to say what their motive is about it. Many would say that it's to remain, keep their tax-free status. Uh, I'm not in a position to, to make that claim. But, I mean, the fact is they are very much appreciated by government, even as directly because of this RRT, which they've set up in most countries where they are resident. Yeah, we used to call that cover, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, like when uh, w- there were th- there's a famous gangster um, in, uh, in Harlem in the 1960s named Bumpy Johnson, and he used to be a heroin dealer. But once a year, he threw turkeys out of the back of a cube van, so everyone liked him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And it reminds Except me of that. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of that. And, and it's I'm I, I don't know. I I I chose to go to to take on this beat, um, and I'm going to see it through. I don't know where it's going to lead me, but I feel like it's it's a David and Goliath story, you know. And Goliath is winning, and I don't know what to do about that. I, I, I'm going to keep on sh- having podcasts. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do all these things. I just don't understand um, why something that seems so self-evident to me is so difficult to to put in the ether. And I'll, I, and I'll never understand. And Richard, you and I have talked for hours and hours and hours about this group. And yes. I think that at the end of every conversation, I think I say a version of the following to you. What the fuck is wrong with everyone? <laughs> why is this happening? Part of my swearing, Ron, I'm sorry. I do that a lot. 
But the you know other, what I mean? The other side to it, as well as the propaganda, is the litigation side, which is that the brethren will use um, lawyers, the, the, the most expensive, the very best lawyers they can get hold of to ruthlessly and relentlessly pursue their critics in the court, former members, anyone who speaks out against them. And even if even if the brethren have no chance of winning, just the fact of tying someone up for years with litigation can be devastating, even if the brethren ultimately lose the case. The other side will probably still end up uh, paying a very large chunk of legal costs and expenses. So, Ron, did you, Ron, deal with any of that stuff too? Because I know that um, you, you expressed the guilt earlier about, um, I think it was about the uh, the doctrine of separation and, and, and having to sort of navigate those waters as a leader. Was there any um, litigation uh, assignments or whatever you want to call it that you would be a part of where it was basically um, bogging down, utilizing the Australian legal system to basically destroy a person? Was that common when you were the leader in Australia? Well, there were several custody cases um, uh, which I, as I've already said to my shame, I was involved in one particularly uh, involving uh, the Devonish family from Edmonton uh, who married an Australian girl. I think Dennis Ragg made reference to uh, his uh, involvement in that case, but I was involved quite closely, indeed, coming to Canada, uh, to Edmonton and Toronto, where there were court cases, and the whole motive was to... Um, take the children, keep the children with the brethren uh, instead of the father's legitimate and right um, relationship with his children. Those are things that I, and I have apologised. I apologise unreservedly uh, to my shame. I was involved in three or four major cases in Australia and, as I said, it crossed over into Canada as well. So, yeah, I mean, we used uh, the top lawyers in Australia, Queen's Councils and uh, everything, just to do our bidding. Um, I look back with horror uh, on that. Uh, it was wrong, wrong, wrong. And that's a pattern too. Richard, you know that. Um, Gerald Shapur, uh, a lawyer here in Canada, used to be the general counsel for the Conservative Party of Canada when they were in charge used to be the personal attorney for Prime Minister Stephen Harper as well. And, you know, and 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 uh, hired a, uh, you know, shady political fixers to hunt you down. Yes, that's right. I mean, the the um, the legal, the brethren using lawyers would go back or using them as a as an attack dog so to speak, would go back, I think, at least to the late 60s or 70s. But the the kind of strong political connections was very much, I think, a Hales invention, and, and in particular, a Bruce Hales invention. Um, and then the business, the business side was a Hales, John Hales, Bruce Hales um, invention. And the three of them all kind of coalesce because they can use these lawyers, these top legal connections they have to access the business and the pol political connections they need. So they've added two more weapons to their arsenal, in effect, in recent years. Um, I was wondering, actually, if if Mr. Ron could tell us something about the history of the, the Hales family in Australia, because they were very prominent uh, back in the 60s, um, and then they were kind of squashed or suppressed extensively, and then they rebounded. Could you could you tell us a little bit of the history, please, Mr. Ron? Uh, well, there were two brothers, as you well know, uh, Bruce Hales, W.B. Hales, and John Hales, J.S. Hales. Uh, they became prominent uh, in the uh, late 1950s, Indeed, W.B. Hales married J.T. Jr.'s daughter, Consuela. Um, they introduced into the Brethren, uh, virtually worldwide, what's referred to as the business system. 
it was a miniature, uh, it was a miniature, I suppose, experiment to what is current today with the UBT. Uh, they rose to prominence uh, virtually, you know, right around the world, uh, in a certain sense, almost eclipsing J James Taylor Jr. in their influence. And then they, he stepped in and said that commerce in the assembly did not belong and they were excommunicated in September, October of 1965 and then reinstated by J.D. Jr. in 1966. Um, John Hales then was um, virtually became, along with some others, the the leader in Australia until he himself was excommunicated in 1976. Um, yeah, they've always been a very prominent family. Yeah, and now they're the worldwide leaders of a mafia <laughs> and a religious cult. I am so blown away every time I talk to uh, somebody who used to be a member of this group just completely blown away like you guys need to like talk me off the ledge because <laughs> i don't know what to do <laughs> i don't even know what questions to ask anymore like i'm pre i prepared for this i read a lot about you I, I you know i tried my best to like to figure out to formulate the right questions but i get into the midpoint of these interviews and i feel like well, i guess we should go now because i i don't know how else to hammer down the point right so so how do you kind of reconcile or how did the brethren reconcile the idea that someone who had been excommunicated twice then becomes the universal leader as john hales did i mean because he must have when he was excommunicated that must have been at the bidding and with the full consent or instruction of james symington so you have to put it in brethren language you have one elect vessel excommunicating another elect vessel. How does that, uh, how do you reconcile those those happenings? Well, John Hales wasn't the elect vessel when, um, the so-called elect vessel, when he was excommunicated. Uh, and yes, the, it, the direction came directly from Jim Symington. Uh, I was out, of course, when John Hales was, uh, uh, took the lead universally, so I'm not privy to how that all worked out. Um, yeah. How do they decide who becomes leader? Like, how does that work? Uh, I think there can be a lot of manipulation, a lot of... Uh, I mean, for instance, leading up to... Uh, Jim Taylor being uh, taking the, the reins. Uh, his father died in 1953, JT Senior, and it wasn't until really 1960 that Jim Taylor became leader. So there was a hiatus, or where the leadership was shared by, you know, several in those years, and it was a force of personality largely. I mean. Uh, J.D. Jr. had a very, very um, charismatic personality and uh, uh, was quite ruthless in his dealing with others. And often it was the elimination of those who were contemporary to them. Yeah. He also allegedly raped uh, a young man as a child and was an alcoholic and would sexually assault women in during meetings. And everyone just sort of sat by. It's funny what brainwashing can do. It, 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 it can, you know, allow you to sort of accept things that Jesus shouldn't, you know, that, that it feels like Jesus obviously wouldn't accept. And that hypocrisy, that embedded hypocrisy, I, I just, I guess you maybe, okay, I, I feel disjointed right now, but I'll, I'm going to bring it back right here. I don't know what it's like to be brainwashed. And maybe my confusion really just revolves around that. Richard, <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. It is, it is the hardest thing to explain, and it, it's even hard to explain to yourself 
and I'm sure Ron would agree with this, it, it's hard to understand yourself, the things that you thought and did. Um, but I always come back to it's not, it's not just brainwashing, it's brainwashing from infancy. Mm. And it's also an intense peer pressure in the sense that everyone you interact with believes the same thing as you do. So you're never exposed to, um, you're never exposed to different ideas, different opinions. Uh, and far more so now that the brethren have their own schools than it would have been, you know, in our day where we at least went to regular schools and rubbed shoulders with people of different faiths and different opinions. But I mean, if you had been raised in a community that believed the world was flat and your parents believed the world was flat, you were never exposed to any media that told you differently, you would believe that the world was flat. It's as simple as that. And it would be very hard to persuade you otherwise. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how, did, how did Hitler uh, arrive at such a, a universal acclaim in Germany? Well, the Catholic Church helped. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church as well. Anyone who hated Jews, really. Mm. <laughs> That's probably what it was. The, the, the universal doctrine of hatred against a certain group of people. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, Ron, to do something that I haven't asked a guest to do before, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. But, Richard, when you told me about there's a... Um, I think he used the term black market communique uh, among younger brethren members that share sort of media that yeah. they wouldn't be normally allowed to look at in that spirit. Um, Ron, is there, if you, if you knew that you were able to speak directly to members of this group worldwide, I'm just wondering what you would say to them knowing what you know now. I would say simply this, that your allegiance, and this is from a totally Christian perspective, uh, that your allegiance is first and foremost to Christ, not to a man. The whole problem with the exclusive brethren is that, uh, is that man and men have been given a place that never, ever belonged to them. And... Christianity uh, is an individual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I would say to each of the brethren. And that in itself is liberating. Yeah, because it goes against, it, it frees them from the shackles of this dictatorship that they're involved with, right? Abs absolutely. Um. I think we're going to have to, I think we'll end it there. Richard, I'm going to keep you for a bit. Um, but Ron, um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for coming. I want to express my gratitude, um, you know, for all the things that you share with us today. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and I would love to have you back. Uh, what I think what I'd like to do is have um, a couple of episodes where I have like three or four ex members on at the same time. Because I don't know how often you guys communicate with each other in a in a setting like this. I know that there's Facebook pages, Richard, that you, that you navigate. Um, but if you're willing to come back, I would love to have you back. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate your time. Ron Fox, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, James. Have a good day. Thank you, Ron. Bye-bye. See you. Wow. Um, that was a unique perspective. I haven't... Um, we haven't talked to anyone that, that has a a bio like, like Ron does. Um, what would, what was that like for you? No, it was very interesting. I mean, Ron Fox was a, a very familiar household name. When I was a child, we used to pray for him in the prayer meeting. And, and then um, when he was excommunicated, we used to pray about all the troubles in Australia and pray that the brethren might be united and so on and so on. So, you know, he was this kind of legendary figure um did the praying the, work richard well it did didn't really i mean one thing i i kind of wanted to ask him is uh and maybe we can ask him next time is whether he uh put, put another way around but the lifetime of a prominent person in the brethren is exceedingly short mm -hmm. they rise to prominence they last a few years and then invariably 
they are either excommunicated or they're kind of shamed and blackballed and moved to the back row and have to sit at the you know the very back row of the meeting hall um and to me that's characteristic of a cult or a dictatorship that when a, a person achieves a certain level of prominence and popularity the dictator feels threatened by them and so just you know either pushes them off the ladder completely or shoves them down at 20 or 30 rungs I, now I could be wrong about this but what I recall at the beginning of our conversation because I sort of asked him a similar question um his answer was similar to Dennis Rags, who he doesn't really know exactly what it was that prompted his removal, right? Yes, yes. Well, exactly. I mean, I think it was probably simply that he he was he was too popular. Um, he had too much of a following, and and James Arlington felt threatened, so just you know bumped him off as we do. Um, oh. I, I mean, of all the people. You know, when I was in the Brethren in the, let's say before 2000, I think all but one of the prominent Brethren I knew of that would have gone around taking fellowship meetings and three-day meetings, and there were probably at least 20 or 30 of them, all but one of them either got demoted or excommunicated. I mean, none of them are now prominent people. It's a very, very short lifetime. It, you know, you, if you speeded up the film, you would see these people running and scrambling up the ladder and falling off and running and scrambling up and falling off. Um, yeah. uh, but, but because a anyone who hangs around near the top for too long, firstly, they get to know too much. And secondly, they become a threat. And uh, so, you know, just don't let them stay too long. Um, yeah. Well, listen, um, there's a podcast starting in about uh, seven minutes, so we're gonna we're gonna stop yeah. it there. Just have to free up the uh, stream for the network. Um, I appreciate your time as usual. Uh, we'll probably talk tonight. Um, please yeah. tell Kanisha that it's your fault, and I don't care what it is. <laughs> yeah, Kanisha okay. is Richard's wife, who's pregnant right now, <clears throat> and um, that means that for the next. How far along is she? Yeah, well, we just had the kind of gender reveal ultrasound scan today. Um, excuse so me. We're all, we're all excuse waiting. me. The gender reveal. Well, you know, the one where they can tell you if it's a boy or a girl or a kitten or whatever it is. That was a bad attempt at uh, gender ideology humor, where yeah, yeah, you don't know. Um, no. Sorry. So we're all kind of waiting with bated breath, and then it turns out the the ultrasound technician sends the results to your doctor, and your doctor tells you. So oh. we, we're we're still not sure. But well, yeah, everything everything is fine. Health okay, is good. good. Well, I'm glad her health is good. Yeah. I'm glad you're good. I'm so happy you're not in a cult anymore because we got to know each other. Thank you. That's great. So am I. <laughs> and uh, and we'll probably talk later tonight, uh, unless Kanisha says yeah. no talking on the phone, and then I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yeah, probably. Okay. Thank you, James. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. I appreciate it. Richard Marsh. Uh, before that, the former Australian leader of the Plymouth Brethren Christian cult, Ron Fox. Uh, the people who watch this show a lot will probably notice that I didn't challenge uh, Ron on his religious beliefs, and that is not my place uh, for these conversations. I am happy that Ron um, is practicing his faith in a way that doesn't include uh, authoritarian figures, thieves, pedophiles, and corrupt individuals. And uh, I, that is not what these podcasts are about. Uh, I have no interest in debating any um, ex-member of the Plymouth Brethren to come on this show to talk about their experiences. I have no interest in debating their religious beliefs at all. I am completely respectful of whatever it is that they believe in now. And I am completely sympathetic to the fact that they have had their lives completely turned upside down uh, because of this cult. You heard Ron Fox talk about the six children and the wife that he had to leave, the 22 grandchildren that he doesn't know, um, the two or three great-grandchildren that he's never met. And I can't even express the type of emotion that I would be feeling if that were happening to me. I'd probably be in jail if that happened to me because of my temperament and the way that I look at family and the way that I don't think things through <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I'm thankful for both uh, he and Richard Marsh uh, for taking time to talk today. 
Uh, tomorrow, I think we have a black ball doubleheader. Um, I say I think because uh, I'm not sure about the one guest, but we will have Richard Marsh. I, I call him Richard Marsh Sr., but it's uh, Richard Marsh's uncle, uh, also in the, U or in the UK, uh, to talk about his experiences with the Plymouth Brethren. He was searching for a higher education and left, I think it was in the early 70s. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think it was around the early 70s um, because they weren't going to allow him to get an education. He sounds like a brilliant man. I've talked to him briefly before. He's very funny, um, but he'll have a lot of interesting insights. <clears throat> and uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. So thank you everyone for joining. I know we weren't on YouTube today. I'm gonna try to sort that out by tomorrow, but uh, I, I appreciate you as always. And thanks for watching Black Bulb.